This channel is part of the History Hit Network. This tiny cave entrance in the village of Alverston, just north of Bristol, is the doorway to a great archaeological mystery. About 40 feet below me, down a narrow, twisting shaft, there's a natural underground chamber. And recently, two local cavers made a fascinating find there. They found that the floor of the cave was littered with bones. These are mainly cow and dog, but they also discovered this human skull. In fact, they found the remnants of three different people, along with these pieces of pottery, which they think may be Roman. So, what was going on here? How did the bones get here? Were they washed down? If so, from where? Or were they deliberately placed here? If so, why? Time team have got just three days to find out. The bones were discovered here three years ago and the local police were called in to investigate. They quickly decided this was an archaeological, not a criminal matter, and the bones were passed on to a local archaeologist. And he's been aching to dig here ever since. Well, it's a very peculiar group of bones. We've got humans in there, and we've got animals, we've got a lot of dog bones. They're all very fresh. They've been, looks as if they've been put down there. Deliberately. Deliberately. What was going on? Well, I think it's ritual. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you're an archaeologist, you always say that when you don't know. You're saying they've actually been placed down there. I mean, you know, these caves, they do that like glorified drains. Now, any amount of stuff can get sucked down there. But the bones are in good condition. They're not, they don't look as if they've been messing no, about in the fields, absolutely. do they? They're and very fresh. Complete skulls are down there. Do we actually know anything? Well, not very much, but one thing we do know is the rough date. We've had radiocarbon dates done on three bones, one dog, one cow and one human, and they range between 170 BC and 120 AD. So it's about 300 years, Iron Age into early Roman. The cavers do reckon there should be more bones down there. How do we get them out? Well, we'll have to go down and dig them out, down that tiny little hole, and actually record where they're lying photograph them and then bring them up and, and have a look at them, see if they've been butchered or cut about or, you know, all that sort of thing. When you say we'll have to dig them out, who's going down first? <laughs> <laughs> history Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans. With exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Our extensive catalogue of documentaries covers everything from the rise of Hannibal Barker to the illustrious treasures of King Tut. So sign up today for broadcast quality documentaries uncovering the mysteries of the ancient world. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. The entrance to the cave is at the bottom of an overgrown dell. Even today it's got a mystical feel to it, and it's easy to see why Mark is convinced that 2,000 years ago this was a sacred place. You've got to cast your mind back into the ancient mind. These were incredibly significant places. It was the sort of the entry to the centre of the earth. This is where the gods lived. And All right, it, it, let's, <laughs> let's assume you're right. This is a ritual site. How do we prove it? Well, the first bit is actually the deposit itself, to see whether there's, for example, how the bones have been cut up, whether they've been put as whole carcasses, um, whole humans, or they've been chopped up in one way or another, whether there's other artefacts with them, ceramics, ritual objects as one way or the other, things that go with the deposit. 
to find out what the deposit actually comprises. That's the first way. The other way is to look at the landscape. This is the key, I think, the understanding of this site. People haven't done this before. Everyone have been down caves, found objects and said, gosh, wow. No one has looked out at the landscape as a whole. What could be here? Well, first of all, it's a sacred place. We do expect a ditch around it to say, this is holy, this is profane. You might also expect shrines. If we're very lucky, we might even find a temple. The geophysics team are already on the case. They're going to survey the land all around the cave. But their first targets are the wooded area right by the dell and the field next to it. You've got to keep smiling all the way down, you know, because we've got Clive here. Hi, Clive. Hello. Who's going to have the camera on you all the way? I oh, know. <laughs> We're ready, Jack. Certainly are. Carenza's Good guide night. for her first descent into the underworld will be Jack Randall, one of the cavers who actually discovered the bones. Whether they were thrown or washed in, the bones probably got into the cave down a wide shaft called a swallet that has since become blocked by a rockfall. So to get to them, Carenza's got to squeeze down through a much narrower twisting shaft alongside. It's a challenging descent. OK. Put your foot down. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Carenza, what can you see? God, it looks like nothing on Earth. It, it, there's a spider's web that's kind of muddy sides of the cave. It looks a tiny space. Come in when it gets down here, it's absolutely bonkers. It, it really looks impossible. Are you going first? Yeah. Uh, four on five, yes. Right. Yeah. OK. The first 30 feet of the shaft is very tough indeed. And after 20 minutes, Carenza's still not reached the bottom. Carenza's just actually squeezing herself through this empty part of the swallow, and now she should have natural bedrock on one side and scaffolding holding up this main rubble on the other side of her. And there it is, which means it's only a short drop to the chamber itself. Wow. Tony, it's really good. I've just got down here. Can you see this? It actually suddenly opens up into a sort of small cave, and there really are stalactites down here. Oh, yeah, I can see them just above your head there. Yeah, be careful with those. Where are we going to dig? This deposit here is the bit that's got most of the bones in. So that's undisturbed, you haven't disturbed that? We haven't gone down from this, we've only disturbed it down to this layer. This is digging spoil here and... The thing I've just slithered down is yeah, your spoil this heap. Yeah, this is spoil heap and so this is sort of the general area that we'll be working. Right, so what we need to do really is start cleaning back onto this layer yeah. and working down through working it. Working down through it. Recording Easy. It. Though, before we can start pulling bones out, we'll need to get some more diggers down the shaft. And that could take a while. Which is not a problem, because there are enough bones above ground already to keep our bone experts Andy Current and Margaret Cox busy for the rest of the day. Andy, these are the bones that the original cavers discovered, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. What can you tell us about the animals? Well, we've got a lot of dogs, Tony. How many? Oh, well, we've got about six dogs, but that means quite a lot of bones. Um, some of the bones go together, we've got remains of uh, single individuals, we've got a little bit of cow, a little bit of horse, but there are rather more dogs than I'd expect, considering the overall size of the bone assemblies. What do you think might have caused all these bits to be in that cave? My gut feeling is that it's a hole in the ground and people are chucking bits of animals in, and maybe some of the dogs are going in after the bits. That's not as exciting as ritual, is it? No, no, sadly, but it could be real life, you know. <laughs> Margaret, you've been looking at the human bones, haven't you? Yeah. What have you come up with here? Well, we've got six individuals represented, four of whom would appear to be female. And one of the really characteristic things about a lot of these bones is that they appear to have been gnawed. So we've got nice sets of teeth marks that you can see on the bone there. Um, these are actually probably caused by a rat. And a lot of the bones are exhibiting those sorts of marks. So you get the impression that these people, when they died, were left lying around and not treated with a great deal of respect. Mm -hmm. 
Leaving carcasses lying around to be gnawed by rats doesn't sound very ritualistic. But it's early days. And our cave excavation is finally underway. Though it won't be easy. Before they can even get to the bone bed, the cave team have got to remove all the spoil. Yeah, well, it's all just a mess. And because it may contain archaeology missed by the cavers, every gloopy ounce must be carefully excavated, then lifted to the surface for more thorough scrutiny. bucket weighs about 10 kilos and has to be man-handled up the shaft by a relay of cables. We've also had to build a ramp up the wall of the dell to get the buckets up the final 15 feet to ground level, where the search for the small stuff takes place. But it's not long before the first batches of spoil are speeding through the system. Exactly well, I must admit, when we were doing the survey, we thought, oh, this is almost a waste of time. And, and then we started seeing bees coming out. The, the swallet hole is here, and unfortunately there's a couple of pipelines really close into it. Um, the rest of the orchard, there doesn't appear to be any archaeology. But once we come into this field, I mean, it looks to be chock-a-block full of ditches, pits. And then look at these responses, really big anomalies. What do we think this might be? Well, it looks like... Ditches, pits, um, maybe sort of occupation. Yeah, probably settlement, I would guess, around here. I mean, the, the responses are strong enough. Where would you like to put a trench? Well, more or less straight through this main big blob and mm. pick up that ditch there where it's particularly strong. We've actually marked it out already. <laughs> yeah. oh, so so where is yeah, it? The ditch is yeah. over here. About this direction, about that here. That sort of line. Coming through here. Yeah. Straight and the blob, up. that and way. The blob, blob down here. So we're about in the centre of it here, OK? So trench one goes in here, about 50 metres from the dell. The search for a perimeter ditch and maybe a shrine is underway. But if this was a ritual site, who were the people who might have worshipped here? Well, looking at the radiocarbon dates, it does look as though we're talking about the people from the mid to late Iron Age. And is that the Celts? What we would call the Celts, yes, yeah, so that's a fairly imprecise term. And would they definitely have had rituals around caves? Well, there's a certain amount of evidence that they would have done, and not just around caves. What's interesting about this swallet hole is that it does look to be very much a parallel with um, Iron Age ritual shafts, most of which are found in the southeast of England, where you've got structured deposits thrown down very deep holes in the ground. Yeah. Did the Celts themselves depict any of these kind of activities? Well, yeah. If I can find it, there's actually a very famous representation in a cauldron called the Gundestrop cauldron that was um, found in a bog in Jutland. And it shows, um, in the relief round the cauldron, the scenes of some form of Celtic religion on it. In particular, here we've got some form of deity um, throwing in, presumably a person, into what's thought to be a hole in the ground. Like, for instance, our hole. At the bottom of which the cave team have been struggling valiantly to get through the spoil to the real archaeology. They've not found much yet, but every now and then they uncover a tantalising promise of what may lie underneath. Oh! Now that looks potentially human, doesn't it? Katie, what do you think? It's a human shin bone, our best find yet. <laughs> wow, look at that. But it alone won't unlock the mystery. We need bones with distinctive characteristics like cut marks, fractures or evidence of disease. And we need to establish whether the bones were thrown down as whole bodies or in bits. <laughs> Luckily, the caver's original hall seems to contain the sort of clues we need, and a hazy picture's already beginning to emerge. These bones aren't worn at all, so it's probable that they were thrown, not washed in. 
and one of them has a particularly sinister story to tell. This is the skull of a female, and what we've got here is a, a very clear-cut case where this person received a fatal blow to the head. I've actually sort of reconstructed her skull very, with some masking tape here, and what you've actually got is a massive injury to the skull here with these radiating fractures running off of it, one there and one there. Um, but not only that, and that was a very, very hard blow, this sort of a cricket bat over the head with a lot of venom behind it and a lot of force. She also had a blow somewhere on the front of her head. How can you tell that? Well, because you've got another radiating fracture coming along here and another one going off there, which, which actually don't come from here at all, they come from something else. And the really interesting thing is that the fracture going along here stopped when it hit the fracture going off from there. Now that tells us that this was the first blow and that this was the second blow. How horrendous. I know. But finding out whether this violent death was part of ritual or something more random is becoming increasingly challenging. In spite of the crispness of the geophys results, there's not a trace of archaeology in Trench 1. No, I agree, but I, I can't believe this isn't natural, you know? It's just so firm that I can't... What, you, you can't believe it's not been it moved about? I don't believe this is archaeological. No. There's not a sniff of archaeology in it, there's not a find in it. What about the ditch at that end? No sign of that at all yet, either. It's not looking good, but the obvious thing to do is still to dig out some more of it. Which they do, but find nothing. The trench is soon abandoned. Yeah. And in the cave where we know there's archaeology, the team can't seem to reach it. Um, I can't do that from here. But just when they too are about to give up for the day... Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, wow, good, good. Jesus. This is human. You're in, Can you get on down there? Shall I tell him? Yeah. <laughs> It's fantastic. We're just going through the digger's spoil and it should be down to the virgin stuff tomorrow. We just had something that looks like a really exciting find come up literally just this second. Are you going to tell us what it is? I think it's a human jawbone. Excellent, excellent. And how near are you to the bottom of the cave? I think we're on it now. And so tomorrow we should be in virgin rock fall with hopefully lots more bones in it. Excellent. End of day one. Maybe things aren't quite so frustrating as I thought. Join us after the break. It's the beginning of day two, and we're going to have to get into the undisturbed layers in this cave if we're going to be able to get a good assembly of bones to show to our forensics people. Corinda, how on earth do you know what's disturbed and what's undisturbed in this great sea of mud? Well, it is a bit difficult, but uh, basically the disturbed stuff is much clayer. You can see all, all this stuff here is just absolutely horrible. It's just quite disgusting, It's all it? just gloopy clay. But when you get below that, you can see you take away the stones here, and we suddenly start to hit an air that's quite sort of wet and shiny, really quite clean. Um, oh, yes, it's just like rubble. Yeah, yeah, just like rocks, watery rocks, really. So. That's our undisturbed layer there. Is this where we're going to limit the digging to? Well, this is, all, this is the only area we've dug in so far, but later on we're going to extend and open up another area of digging just below the spoil heap, just beyond Katie there. God, the cave's much bigger. Ash, can you just shine? A, yeah, you can it's really cute. see. It's lovely, well. <laughs> how big it is, can't you? To start with, the team are going to concentrate on the area where Carenza's digging. Now they're through the spoil, bones are sticking out all over the place and it shouldn't be long before we get them to the surface. Where, after yesterday's empty trench, geophys are in trouble. All this response here, it's just simply not a natural response. This has to be archaeology from our point of view. If this was all just natural, then how on earth would we ever find any archaeology with these techniques? What we want is another opportunity to in investigate another linear and another area of noise. If you still don't find anything, no. then we'll go away and find yeah. another job. Well, let's put oh, a trench. <laughs> <laughs> now, I believe in geophysics. We must put a trench across it. If you mark us one out, we'll dig it. Well, right. let's do two. Two? Two. Come on. Just to be sure. Yeah. 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 Trenches two and three could hold the key to the site. 
Not to mention Geophys's professional reputation. I've still got a job, Mick. I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure? Well, I've got something totally different That's to feel. It. I've got a very thin layer of black burning charcoal and things like that. It's ever so thin. Worth a point. You think so? Definitely. And then when you get to here, I've got a, really quite a sharp edge and the archaeology totally changes. Well, that's certainly not natural, is it? No, no, um, not at all. I mean, it just looks, even though it's only a thin layering, that's going to give a strong anomaly. So we want some cut features to go with it. It's too early to tell what the burning might be, but it's a start. John's off the hook. Yeah. For the moment. <laughs> The cave team have hit a rich scene. They found rat bones, evidence the bodies weren't left lying around but were gnawed down the cave. And all around them are bits of human, bits of cow, but most of all, bits of dog. I've got tooth here. It's a, it's a dog tooth, I think. What's all this business about dogs? We found evidence of at least six already. Yes, there does seem to be some possible evidence of a regional dog cult in this part of the world. Um, not only have we got Alverston, but we've also got quite a lot of dog burials coming from Kerwent, just across the Bristol Channel. But the best, best example is at Lydney, isn't That's it? Right. Which is just sort of over the hill, about four, ten miles away, the other side of the River Severn. And from Lydney, a most stunning statuette of a dog was found. This statue out of the dog was actually found right in the middle of the main temple building at Lydney in what appears to be a representation of a ritual shaft. Ah, there you are. You've got it really quite homely in here, haven't you? Eh? Oh, victory you've already started. Yeah. There's a possibility, if our site was part of the local dog cult, that we might find something like this bronze figure at the bottom of our shaft. But we're taking no chances. Victor and bronze caster Andrew Lacey are going to make a replica of the Lydney dog with the same technique used to make the original. It's called the lost wax process, and stage one is to model the dog in wax. And then once that's hardened off... What... Once that's hardened off, and all the modelling's been done and all the fine detailing's been done, right. I have to apply um, a clay, clay loam mixture. That's going to be the, the mould, the casting mould. Right. Then we heat that up. Yep. Burn the wax out. So you got your cavity. And replace it. it with a bronze. Yeah. But first, Victor's got some delicate work to do. Andy, have you seen this? Yeah. It's quite a remarkable bone, this. Back in the forensics greenhouse, our investigation has just taken a very macabre turn. Well, it's a human femur thigh bone. Look at the fracture down the middle. That's a very, very unusual fracture. I've examined thousands of human skeletons and I've never seen a, a femur fractured in that way. I've seen material like this in late glacial sites uh, down at Cheddar, not far from here, but only in association with assemblages where we know people have been eating each other. This is the kind of fracture you would get if you wanted to split that bone open to extract the marrow from the middle. If this is cannibalism, it's a stunning discovery. Until now, there's been no evidence of cannibalism since the Bronze Age, but we've been able to date our bone to the late Iron Age, no more than 2,000 years old. It's a chilling thought and needs further investigation. Give it a good... Hit, hit it there, you it, Give it a good smack. Oh my God! <laughs> this is a, a Margaret, br Margaret, bring it, bring it back. <laughs> Breaking a bone along its length isn't easy. It's not likely to have happened accidentally. But to prove it was done intentionally, with the specific aim of extracting the marrow, Phil's going to try and emulate the fracture on a fresh deer bone. That's the stuff that we're after, That jelly, that, that's the that's, stuff. That's incredibly nutritious, fatty material down the middle of bone, and people like to eat it. Well, there's a devil of a lot. Ooh. 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 Ah, Ooh. Ah, 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 ah. Look, we have exposed Ooh, marrow. the marrow. Look at that. Yuck. Lovely. Ugh. Smells horrible. Ooh. Oh! Hey. Oh! That's what we want. Big success. Look at that. Oh, gorgeous. Oh, 
was, you could almost, couldn't you? Uh, no, all right. No, you... Now, look, that fracture there, where it's split out, is exactly the same as that one there. See, this bit that's missing is a modern break. Yeah. So, really, when they've split it, they've just split it down to there and it's sheared out, just like ours has done, sheared out at that end. That that's exactly it. It's fantastic. Couldn't have been better. That's brilliant. And it makes it almost certain the femur from the cave was indeed cannibalised. Quite what this means for our investigation isn't yet clear. We need more clues from the cave. But we're unlikely to get any very soon because the cavers have hit a problem. When the bones were originally thrown into the cave, they formed what archaeologists call a cone of deposition, only part of which is accessible from the chamber. This is what the team have spent the morning digging. But to go any further, they're going to have to dig under the scaffolding here, which is retaining several tonnes of rubble. The archaeologists got to stop while more scaffolding's installed. What we'll need to do is we'll need to put some scaffold bars on here, carrying on down in. Yeah. There will probably be archaeology in behind, which will... We'll just have to leave that. Well, we can't, obviously it's not safe to get to it, but if we carry that scaffolding on down... Rather you than me. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to delay us, but at least the cavers have got all the right tools and raw materials to hand. Imperial on metrics, Steve. Oh, Andy, do you want one? Yeah, please, I've got one. And the morning's archaeology has produced more than enough material to keep the sprayers and sorters busy. But if this is a ritual site, we'd expect to find more than bones. We'd expect the cave to contain votive offerings, like coins, figurines or high-class pottery. What have we got, Neil? Well, we've got two main periods, Tony. We've got the modern, we've got a bit of milk bottle, we've got a bit of beer bottle, we've even got a bit of whiskey bottle. <laughs> but we've also got some Roman pottery, which is good news. It's typical Roman cooking pot ware, made in Dorset. And this particular piece has got some very faint decoration, size lines on it. You can hardly see it. But this shows its late Roman date, 3rd or 4th century AD. What's the quality of this stuff? Uh, it's pretty poor. I mean, it's very basic cooking pot. We don't have any fine wares. And interestingly, nearly all of these sherds have been very badly abraded. They're very worn. You can see the burnishing mm. has worn off this piece of black burnished ware. This makes me think that it's probably residual. It's been in plough soil. It's been subjected to weathering and cultivation damage and has been deposited in the cave by water action later on. Is there anything here that you can see that would lead us to believe that this is a ritual site? No. Richard? No, not at the moment. <laughs> hmm, well... <laughs> <laughs> but Mark's not the only one under pressure. The burning in Trench 2 turned out to be a recent bonfire. Both it and Trench 3 appear to be empty of archaeology and have been, for the time being, abandoned. So Geophys have moved on to their next targets, these two fields on the other side of the Dell. And down the cave, the civil engineers are still at work. These aren't exactly the most ideal conditions for putting scaffolding in. It's a cramped, cold and fiddly business, and it'll take the rest of the day. Uh. The archaeologists can do no more than record and wait. Do we know if it was but at least their morning's haul has yielded another valuable clue. One of our victims was suffering from a very unusual disease. Yeah, it's something called Paget's disease, and this is a normal femur, and that's the thickness of the, the bone. And this is the diseased femur, and you can see that there's a massive difference there in, in density. What would that do to your body? Well, you might think this makes your bones really hard and tough, but it doesn't because it actually makes them very, very soft. So you get a sort of a curve of the spine and your legs start to bow, and they call it a simian gait. People sort of slump forward and walk very unnaturally. Can you tell anything about the age of this person? This disease usually only presents to people over the age of about 60. So, yeah, this is an older person. So to our collection of dogs and victims of cannibalism and murder, we must now add an old and physically disabled person. The mystery is deepening. 
You've had 36 hours to look at this assemblage. Yeah. Why do you think the bones were in the hole? I still think that we're looking at random disposal down a convenient hole in the ground. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'd go along with that. Even the murdered one? Yeah, if, if it was somebody you didn't like, if it's somebody, an enemy in battle, um, you wanted to get rid of the body, you didn't want to bother with a proper funeral and all that that entailed, then what could be easier? The, you know, hole in the ground, get rid of it. What would we need to convince you that it was ritual? Well, we'd be looking at some nice high-status goods, some grave goods, maybe some nice bronze figurines or some nice pottery. Of which there's still no sign. But evidence of ritual archaeology on the surface would be just as convincing. And geophiers might just have found it. They've got very faint traces of something in the field on the other side of the dell. Trench 4's underway and appears to contain archaeology. You could almost say there was, there was a, back, a back edge here. Back edge there. Uh, and I've got the other edge here. Yeah. Back, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a really weak anomaly. To be honest, nine times out of ten we wouldn't go with it. Yeah. But the fact you've actually got something that does correspond with the anomaly, well, it's the only thing we've got so far. True, true. Could this be the lifeline Geophys and the ritual theory so badly need? Treat it with respect. Ah! You've got it! <laughs> Straight out of the fridge. Oh, my God! Isn't, isn't, that, that, isn't that gorgeous? That is beautiful, isn't it? So what so are we going to do with it? You're going to pack clay right. on it? Just Not no. yet. The first thing I've got no. to do is put the runner system on. All right. The runner system is the means by which the molten bronze gets into the mould and the air out. Andrew makes the parts out of wax and attaches them to Victor's dog. Just got a vest. That's it. So okay. what is going to happen then? You will now encase this entire <sighs> thing in clay. Yep. Yeah. We will then heat it up. The whole, all of the whole of this will just melt. That's it. So we will have a void in the clay, which is the, where the dog is, plus this. That's it. You then pour the bronze in there. It flows down through there, through there, through there, and the air rises vent, up, vents back up out there. That's it. The moulds made of a mixture of clay, dung, and goat hair. Love. So that's completely covered, and there really is nothing much we can do more to it today, then? No, that's it. All it's got to do is let it sun dry. It's 6.30, day two, just when we were screaming with frustration because there was no archaeology in trenches one, two and three, and we had to stop digging down the hole because they had to shore it up to prevent collapse. Suddenly, archaeology starts popping up out of trench four. Why did you start to dig here, John? Well, I'm not really sure, to be honest. We, we were getting desperate. I mean, we got so much flack for getting things wrong on the other side, which, you know... You're still not convinced that you I'm did still, get things No, wrong. no. But here, look, there was a hint of a ring so we thought, well, we, why not? We've gone for it, and look for yourself. What is it, Ian? We've got two post holes, one, two. So have you excavated half of each one, then? Yep. And what's that that you've got inside, then? Well, have a look. Well, it's pottery. I think it's Iron Age pottery. And did you actually find that inside the hole? Yep, in the bottom of that hole there was that piece, and in the bottom of this one, that piece. So, are you happy that that categorically dates whatever this structure is to the Iron Age? Yes, sir. Brilliant. <laughs> Phil, what do you think this is? Well, I mean, the natural inclination is to say it's got to be an Iron Age roundhouse. But two post holes don't make a roundhouse. So what we've got to do is to strip off an area across there and go right out to the digger and see if we can find any more of these post holes and actually see if we can get an arc of post holes. Then we'll have our roundhouse. So, it's the end of day two. We already know a great deal about how our Iron Age people died. Tomorrow, let's hope we can find out a lot about how they lived and why they had a hole of death at the bottom of their garden. Join us after the break. Beginning of day three and already our site's a frenzy of activity. Over there, Mick the Digs looking for our Iron Age roundhouse. Mick, how are you getting on? Hello, Tony. We've just started to extend the trench and we should have some answers for you in a couple of hours. 
Excellent, cheers mate. Over here, this by the way is our communication centre. Over here we've got the chute bringing up all the muck from the cave. Keep going lads. And round here somewhere, Mark Horton wants to open another trench, predictably under our radio masts. <laughs> well, what are you doing? Well, it's the obvious place. This is where they would have dropped the stuff down into the cave. Right. So we'll put a trench here. Mark excavating for straws to clutch at. And down here, about 40 feet below us in the cave, there's Carenza. Carenza, what are you doing? Oh, working flat out down here, Tony. Yeah, it's fantastic. We've got the scaffolding sorted out now, and so we've got a whole new area we can dig into. And it's absolutely brilliant. We've got uh, two dog skulls and a human jawbone and long bones just sort of lying about on the surface we've exposed. It's fantastic. While the archaeology is chugging along nicely, Mark and Andy have decided to take some time out to try to settle their differences. Mark still convinced the bones were thrown down the cave ritually. Andy is resolute in his belief it's simply a dumping ground for unwanted carcasses. Yes, I th think we're missing the big picture that this deposit is not a normal deposit. It's been deliberately placed down there and the the, the, the human, they, we've got a murder, or maybe a sacrifice, depending on how you call it. We've got cannibalism. Cannibal, we've never, ever found it in Britain in the late prehistoric period. It's completely unique. I mean, you know, millions of bones, hundreds of bones have been dug, but not one single example. There's something extraordinary going on here. Andy, you're looking sceptical. I don't see anything that unusual yet. We've got a small number of people, a relatively small number of dogs. Dogs are the most common things, and maybe we've got six dogs. I mean, it's, it's a lot of bones, but there are a lot of bones in a dog. We might be seeing the only pocket of bones there are in that, that particular You've deposit. never been down there? No, You're I too large. I can't <laughs> get down <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. I've been down there. There are bones everywhere. They're coming in. We're just doing a tiny sample of it. But there are bones absolutely everywhere in that deposit. And we know that we're just cutting the edge of the deposit cone, and we go into that deposit cone, more and more bones. But what about this cannibalism? I don't understand why you're not more excited about that. I am excited about it intellectually, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I think we're some way away from a plausible explanation at the moment. I really do. You do not eat people because you're hungry. We've, this is a productive, in the late Iron Age, it's an incredibly productive landscape. There's lots of food around. The only time you eat people is for highly structured ritual reasons. You want to imbue the spirits of your ancestors, all those sorts of no, things. No, I think if you look at... Ethnic We've got just six hours to try and settle this dispute. And we're going flat out. In Trench 4, John and Chris have found a new job and they've joined in the frantic search for an Iron Age roundhouse. At the edge of the dell, the hunt for a ritual throwing off point is well underway. And down the cave, the team are pulling bones out like their lives depended on it. which means plenty of trade for the forensics team. Delivery for you. Oh, yes! <laughs> Quite a lot that time. Oh, wow, look at this. Oh, yeah, some human stuff. But in well. spite of all the bones, there's a growing problem for the ritual theory. There are no ritual finds. No posh pottery, no figurines, not even a coin. In fact, the only remotely ritual artefact on site is Victor's wax dog. And now the mould has dried, it's going to be sacrificed. It's starting to go, oh, gone out. Yeah. And well, what's good there is it that... Goes, yeah. So is that my dog going up in a smoke? That is your little dog, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another half hour or so, and the mould will be empty of wax and ready for the bronze. But all eyes are suddenly diverted to Trench 4, where Mark and Neil are getting very excited. Have we found the roundhouse? <laughs> Not exactly. What does <laughs> not exactly mean? Well, what we have found yeah. is a row of Iron Age post holes. Now, you can see, Mark, if you carry your tape measure... Right. Am I allowed to come in this you trench? You are, yep, 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 be careful. Mark at the far end. These are the two we had last night, aren't yep. they? Another one up where the helmet is with Mark. Here, another one here. Another one here. There it is. Yeah, I see, just round there, yep. So we've done 
from spacing out, and they're, they're about eight foot apart. Yes. So eight foot down from there brings us just about to here, and maybe you can just see, I think we have the start of another post hole here. So we've got a line of post holes, but they're not circular. They're more like in a line. Of... How can we get excited about a line of post holes? Well, because it could be defining a trackway leading down to the gillet. A ritual trackway? Or, or, or... <laughs> it could be a square or rectangular building, and only temples in the Iron Age are square or rectangular. Well, a temple would certainly settle the matter, so the hunt for post holes continues. But there are ever fewer clues from the bones. Although the morning's collection contained some juicy specimens, like a skull, some ribs and this human jawbone, none of the items are diagnostic of ritual. High levels of attrition. Yeah. Nothing more striking or significant than that, really. <laughs> and there's no sign of anything ritual in Trench 5. In fact, there's no sign of anything at all. Basically, <laughs> there's nothing here. We haven't really found anything at all. Anything in the plough zone? No, one bit of flower pot. Yes, just, just modern rubbish, basically. No room for pottery. No nothing room at pottery. all. How deep's natural? Well, we are natural. This is subsoil. It's completely undisturbed. I mean, it is natural. The bedrock is, you know, 30 centimetres further down. But... I, I do think we need sea bedrock. Uh, there's geological reasons for seeing it, and also archaeological. Well, I don't think there's an archaeological reason, <laughs> because this is undisturbed. There's no way there can be any features. Well, we're not absolutely certain. We've got a small exposure. There should... If there are features underneath it, it still may be sealed underneath, underneath this, this loam. Look, how deep is it? About 30, 30 centimetres. That would take 10 minutes. Well, Mark? would you... You <laughs> okay, can do it. <laughs> Give me a pick. Give me a pick, and I'll do it. <laughs> Hard, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Worse still, there's been a small rock fall in the cave. And to prevent the remaining tons of rubble burying everyone alive, the civil engineers have had to move back in. Hello, Carenza, it's Tony. Can you hear me? Yeah, Tony, just about. I have to say, we're getting a bit frustrated that we're not getting more stuff out. Uh, do you think you'll be able to increase the delivery? <laughs> if you knew how hard it was, you would <laughs> give us a bit of a break on that. Um, we have got down onto the bone layer now, though, and you can see here we've got this fantastic... I think it's a human femur, a human leg bone, um, and there's some ribs up here, and, and there's quite a lot of bone turning up now. I'm sorry you're getting frustrated, but we are going as hard as we can. But it's cramped and increasingly dangerous down there, so the archaeologists can't rush anything. As soon as I've got this rock off, are you ready? All right, OK. OK. Let's quit. So this is it. This it's is crunch it. time, too, for our ritual dog. The wax has melted and it's time to make the casting. This is the danger moment. The bronze is 1,100 degrees centigrade. And if Andy gets it wrong, it's not just the dog that'll suffer. And I just want to go for it now. Good God. Whoop! Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Yeah, uh, that's the, is that the air coming out? No, that's... Uh, it's a little bit of vapour. Uh, right. What does that mean for the casting? But it's, um... a bit 50-50 at this point. Oh, my God. Oh, too bad. oh, gosh, we've got more edge. We've got the edge coming through. Those are better odds than anyone will give Mark, who's now a desperate man. He found only bedrock in Trench 5 and has decided to reopen Trench 2. He's convinced it does, after all, contain the proof he needs. That's right. That's me ditch. Well... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. That's me ditch. That's me ditch. It's a huge feature, isn't it? If it is a ditch, it's mm. very, very wide. Yeah, that's exactly what it ought to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. Great. Mark might be right, but the trace is too faint. And we'll probably never know for sure if this is a ditch or not. Is this going to involve science? No. No? We'll just hit it with a hammer. <laughs> 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 Hold on, let me see if I can glance that. Ooh, oh, the bot. Oh. Right, OK, oh, I'm not going to touch that. You should do that, yeah. Ah! Ah! Come on. Ah! 
Ah, yeah, no. Wow. Yes, there it is. No. There's its haunches, Off there's its end. tail. <laughs> there's the other side of the body. We got the dog. Oh, no, hey. oh, look at the detail in it. Oh, look, there's the head. Look, there's his nose. That's fantastic. All our dog needs now is some minor surgery and a bit of a polish, and it'll be as good as the original. Elsewhere, though, time's running out. The cave's now too dangerous for the archaeologists to continue working, and only the scaffolders remain. Right, this is the last of the bone. Oh, thank you. But our cave team's done an amazing job. In three days, they've recovered more than 200 different bits of bone, upped the minimum body count for both dogs and humans, and found enough different body parts to suggest whole carcasses were being thrown in. We've, we've got you know, at least seven individuals represented. Nearly every bone in the body is represented in one or the other of these trays or bags. So you know, we're, very, I think, very sure that whole people were going into that um, pothole. But as far as forensics are concerned, that's still not enough. What sort of state they were going in and who put them there, we're, we're absolutely no closer to answering. Not surprisingly, that view isn't shared by the ritual camp. They argue the unusual quantity of dogs and the evidence of murder and cannibalism can only be explained as evidence of some bizarre rite. And they're supported in this by one of the country's leading Celtic experts. I think it's unlikely that these are natural killings. These are the normative rite, if we can talk about a normative rite in the, in the Iron Age, is cremation. Formal burial is quite rare anyway, so to find this group of individuals in this situation, I think smacks of something rather suspicious and slightly sinister. What about this cannibalism, the slicing of the bone, presumably, to eat the marrow? Well, that is very suggestive. Now, I think where you've got that, it's almost certainly happening within the context of human sacrifice. We have a number of classical writers like Pliny who actually talk about human sacrifice among the Gauls and the Britons, and, oh, shock horror, they eat them as well. And you can imagine that this sort of thing wouldn't be happening because people were hungry and the, and the human body was just lying around. It would be as a kind of, perhaps, contempt, insult. I think the idea of social deviance or people who are other, who are alien, either because they belong to different communities or because they transgress some kind of social taboo, they were treated with contempt, visibly so. So they were buried without grave goods. They were buried without the normal pots and the niceties that, that most people were buried with. And perhaps the ultimate insult would be to gnaw a piece of your leg just before you deposited the body. So any ritual activity here might have centred on humiliation, murder and cannibalism of a particular group of people. Social outcasts. And it might explain why the old person with Paget's disease wound up down the hole. Perhaps they were cast out and killed because of their terrible ape-like disfigurement. To those elements, we can now add the final intriguing twist. The post holes in Trench 4 aren't a temple, they're part of a trackway, and it's heading straight for the dell. It might be a coincidence, but it's tempting to believe the trackway was a processional route and an essential part of the ritual. After all, what could be more humiliating than being publicly dragged down it on the way to one's own sacrificial murder? What happens to this cave now? Well, we've just been finishing putting in the conservation tapes yeah. to preserve the cave formations and also the archaeology. Um, so if anybody wants to go back and carry on the digging, they're welcome to. Well, if more archaeologists come back, let's hope they find a votive offering next time. This is the dog that was made for us this weekend. Here, you can have that. Awesome. Lovely, thanks. Our archaeologists are going to be arguing all through the night about actually what happened here 2,000 years ago. But one thing we can say for certain, our ancestors, who lived here a very short time ago in historical terms, lived lives which in some aspects were so brutal that it still makes me shudder to think about it.